members of the university community and special guests. On behalf of Universidad Panamericana and of Escuela de Empresariales, we want to welcome you to this event, which in the framework of the 71st meeting of the World Scout Foundation and of the 50 years of the Universidad Panamericana, we have the, hon the honor of having with us. To welcome them in our university, I want to give the floor to Dr. Jose Antonio Lozano Diaz, who is the general director of Universidad Panamericana, who will give us a brief message. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, distinguished members of the university community and distinguished members, especially His Majesty Carl XVI Gustav from Sweden, Her Majesty King Queen Sylvia from Sweden, Her Royal Highness Prince William from Luxembourg, Her Royal Highness Prince Lamia Al Saud from Saudi Arabia, Mr. Lance Collins, Mr. Manuel Jarango, and Mr. Hector Robledo Cervantes. All of them are distinguished members of the Scout World Foundation. Please be welcome to Universidad Panamericana. This university today is joyfully celebrating your presence here. These are the first 50 years of existence. During these 50 years, we have focused on the formation of young people who, in spite of, who, in addition to having high competences regarding technical aspects, they are also formed in values and in a vision of, of life regarding service for others and service to the community in which they are developing. This also meets this also meets the, the Scouts' values. We are very honored to be here and very happy to have you here because among other things, we can listen to your experiences and we can also have you, have you here in your cl close to 100 years and you have conquered the world with a very valuable legacy. And in this, in this meeting, we are trying to create a better world. Creating a better world is something that we think is very important in this university. The mission of Universidad Panamericana establishes so. Through dialogue and through study, we have to find the truth in, in, this, in our search. And that is our essential, that is the essential mission of the university in order to get to have a better world. Today, I also have the honor in, of saying in front of you uh, the pride of a country that has proved to be very solitary in the last years. The tragedies that Mexico has been through and the earthquakes have also shown a very hard evidence of how important our others are for us, how that social vision is still important for us, and how we care for others who have been through troubles. It grabs my attention that the list here that try to help, we're trying to help others. And that list was even bigger than, than our, our own university community. From the university, we are also interested in fighting for students to have a profile when they come out of the university that includes commitment towards others. It is very important for us to receive you in the Universidad Pan Panamericana. We have to know better the World Scout Foundation. And as we have shown in, during the first words, are very similar to our university. And we also want to learn from these good practices, which they will share with us. They'll talk to us about success cases led by young people in countries that are very dear to us, such as Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Haiti. It is a great honor to have you here today. I hope that you can feel at ease in our institution and that you can see us as a potential ally for the initiatives 
for the formation initiatives that will take place in Mexico. Please be very welcome and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your message, Mr. General Director. Now I want to give the floor to the, to the World Scout Foundation to formally begin this event. Good morning, everybody. Wow, that was, uh, that was quite dramatic, I think. Um, Your Majesties, ladies and gentlemen, friends, welcome to the World Scout Foundation's first investor conference. Now, my name's Tom Marsden. I'm going to be your curator today. We have seven super passionate, super excited, and absolutely unbelievable scouts backstage waiting to tell their story to you. Now, before we get them on stage, I'm going to blab a little bit more I want to say two thank yous. First one, to Ricardo Salinas Pliego for supporting scouting for the last couple of years and also putting the foundation in touch with TV Azteca. Uh, Isaac and the team have been absolutely amazing and the reason this looks so sexy and slick is because of them, Not, nothing to do with us. Yeah, thank you, TV Azteca. And the second thank you has to go to the UP. This is a place we've spent a couple of hours. And we've gone around and we've really sensed the atmosphere. There is innovation, there is creativity, and there is a passion to want to do things a little differently. And that is very, very similar to scouting. Now, you might think that we are here to recruit more young people into scouting. We're not. If we do, that's brilliant. If you've got children or grandchildren or brothers and sisters that you think might be good for scouting, get them involved because it will transform their lives. But that's not our priority today. Our priority is also not to get new volunteers either. If that happens, then brilliant. That's amazing. We're here today because you are our shareholders and this is a shareholders meeting. You invest in us, you make sure that scouting is as, be is as good as it can be. And we want to show you what we do. This is the return on investment. And we want to make sure that we are returning what you expect from us. We have 51 million scouts on the planet. We want to grow that to 100 million and beyond in the next couple of years. And that is going to translate into community action uh, and leadership in young people. Now, I'd like to welcome on stage our first leader, 
Her name is Jessica. She's one of your own. She's from Mexico City. So if you could give her a really, really warm welcome, that would be great. Jessica. Good morning to you all. My name is Jessica Rodriguez. I'm 22 years old and I come from Mexico City. For me, it is a honor for you to be here. I want to tell you about what we, go, what we went through here in Mexico during the terrible earthquakes. September 19, 1985, an earthquake of 8.2 in the rich curve scale damaged badly Mexico City. 32 years later, history repeats itself. Same day, different date, and different magnitude. In that moment, we were all very scared, especially me. I had never been through an earthquake. I didn't know what to do. So first of all, I verified that my house and my family were all right. Once I verified that, I realized that my, my place of origin, my home, was badly damaged. My legs started shaking just from remembering that. For me, that was a very hard moment because we reached the place in which we could be helpful. We got there with food, we gave it to people, but we realized that people really needed coordination. People were running about, there were people hurt, there were people who didn't know what to do. And at that time, in that moment, a group of seven scouts and three family members, we made the decision to coordinate every action from from gathering centers, health centers, because that was important, because that was from where we were getting the help. Especially, we made the decision to help the people to remove the, the damage in the fallen buildings. When a woman comes up to us and she tells us, we need help in this plaza. It was a small shopping center that collapsed during the earthquake. People were inside of that center. The city was completely collapsed, and the rescuers couldn't make it. We were very afraid. We were not rescue people. We didn't know if moving a rock could affect someone else who might also be alive. I'm very small in size, but still, I don't know where I got my superpowers from and I was able to carry huge rocks. I, I can tell you that we were happy to rescue seven lives. We did this. We helped. It is very moving for me to talk about my people and my hometown. My hometown is Xochimilco. For a long time, we helped. People were telling us that they trusted us. People didn't want us to leave. However, there were some days where we didn't get any sleep. We were extremely tired. But we were there, helping people. Later, some independent companies, the UNAM, etc., they helped us get the material to reconstruct and rebuild. That was very important for us because people were really affected by that. We started building houses and little by little we started getting help to gather material and start rebuilding homes. Three months later, after the earthquake in December, we had 119 houses under construction. 
So six months after the earthquake, we would have 210 homes. This hasn't been an easy job at all. The job, the work is not only carried out by me, this work is carried out by everyone in the people, by all of the scouts who are helping us. I am very glad to say that even though this is not a project that, has, that was structured, it came out of the blue. And it is really very exciting for me to share it with you. Hands up, Mexican people. This means silence, respect, but mostly for us, this means union. I would like to tell you that at that moment, all of the scouts from Mexico went out of their houses and helped. However they could, but they helped. I want to invite you to all to get inspiration out of our stories so that we can create a better world with better conditions. Because each one of us is born a star. And that star, we need to make that star shine. Thank you to all of you. Um, never a truer word said, I think you'll agree. Um, thank you very much, Jessica. You did a really good job getting big hugs there, that's fantastic. What is most important about this story, I don't need to translate into my own language, what is most important about this story is Jessica is one of 4,000 stories, one of 4,000 scouts who didn't think twice about picking up their scout scarf and taking their skills, their leadership, into the streets to go and do whatever it was they needed to do. They partnered with professionals who do know what they're doing, the Red Cross, the government organizations, and they supported their progress to make sure that many more people survived um, and weren't left trapped under the rubble. So, amazing story. We could have picked one of 4,000 Jessicas, but Jessica is the star today. Um, I would now like to invite up some more Mexicans uh, this time not from Mexico City, they're from Tijuana, up in the north. It's, oh, don't say oh, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Tijuana, up in the north. Um, so could Kenya, a transformed scout, Marciela, an amazing leader, and Diana, a super duper volunteer, come onto the stage, please. Round of applause. Hello, good morning everyone. Buenos dias a todos. My name is Diana Carrillo. I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico. And we are here with Kenya and Maricela. They both live in Tijuana, Baja California, on the northern, on the border of Mexico. And I know them for three years, where I was a volunteer for the Scout Experience, which was created by the Scouts Association of Mexico in collaboration with the International Collaboration Agency from the United States. And we were working in three zones of that were very vulnerable. They are were part of those groups and part of the community, and we want to share their story, and they want to share their story with you. Kenya, would you like to tell us how were you before you entered the Scouts? Yes, I was a very aggressive person. I broke the arm of a colleague, and people used to come with me because I picked up fights, 
and you are wondering why was I so aggressive? Well, I was molested, and when that happened to me, I f when I was aggressive with somebody, I was I felt good because because I felt that people paid attention to me. How was your house, your school, your family? I didn't like to be with them. I didn't pay attention. I was a rebel. I didn't like to be with anybody. And how was that you knew, get to know about the scouts? What was what caught your attention? Well, they went to my school and they motivated me. And they talked with us. And when they left, our teacher said that we were going to enroll those who got good grades and who were great. And when I told him that I wanted to go, they, he told me that I couldn't because I was irresponsible. I picked up fights and I did a lot of bad things. And I felt really bad because I wanted to improve and nobody helped me. And I thought that nobody cared about me. But I decided that I wanted to go to the scouts. And they told me they had a meeting on Wednesday. They wished me good luck. Unfortunately, they were late. Because they had a registry about the members of that meeting. And I couldn't go. And I could go to the to the meeting. Did you go to that first meeting? No. I went till the first Saturday. And how was that first day? What was the thing that you liked the most? Well, I first came and I was very angry. I was upset. But they were so kind to me that reduced all my anger. And I started feeling good. I felt like I was in my family. Like I found my first love. I felt protected. I found the family I needed, the understanding that I needed. And now that you've been for a while in the Scouts, how do you think that helped you? How do you think you've changed? Well, I've improved in my house, in my family, even in the school. You're not violent anymore. You're not aggressive anymore. No. The scouts have helped me a lot. Most of all, all the anger I felt turned into happiness. And Maricela, can you tell us about your story to the scouts? Well, good morning. In 2003, my oldest, uh, my eldest son wanted to look for activities where he and my other two sons could be active because I didn't want them to be at home without doing nothing. And I looked for parks, but in this case, in the courts of my community, two scouts approached us and they invited us to form part of the movement. They told me, asked me if I wanted to take my sons to these activities. Be and I was very surprised because even though I knew scouts, I didn't know there were groups in our communities. So my son at first was afraid, but only once he arrived, because once he started participating, he made activities when he was eight years old. He knew what a scout was, and he was always there, always present in the activities. And now I am a mother of three scout members. And I got involved as an adult. I worked with the parents. And after that, I was a deputy head of the movement. 
and afterwards I am the head of the group and in 2018 it's been three years that I'm the head of the group and I'm very happy about it well congratulations Maricela and which are the main challenges to develop young people within the scout movement. The main challenges are to create conscience amongst adults in my community to achieve that us adults need to be scouts as well. Another challenge would be to impact uh, so that we can eliminate violence of the communities, to eliminate insecurity, to take young people and children to the streets and to foster as well dreams and goals for everybody in their lives. But in the meantime, I think it is necessary that we need to foster volunteer activities, international and national and local volunteering activities, because that's going to unite us. And they're going to foster all these activities once they are growing up. For example, in your case, you were volunteer with us. Well, finally, Kenya, speaking of these dreams and goals that we want to foster within the young people and children, which, which are your dreams, finish high school, finish uh, to finish the university. I want to study uh, criminalistic, and I want to to bring something to my community so that people can see that Mexico can do anything. Thank you very much. Thank you both. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for your attention. So that young lady there, it took her quite a lot to stand or to sit on this stage and tell her story. And because of Maricela, she has a really safe place that she's been able to develop and become a fabulous young lady. I sat down and had a drink uh, with those two last night and just discussed the project a little bit more. I wanted to know the ins and outs of it. And the real story from this uh, presentation is actually from the adult volunteers. Marciella gives up four or five hours a week and she spends it with 50 young men and women like Kenya. I said, if you could dream a little bit, and you had all the volunteers in the world, all the adult volunteers in the world, how many young people in your town would join scouting? And she didn't think, straight off, 300. I was like, wow. That means that myself, John, Craig, Ahmed, we are underachieving. That is why we are trying to grow the movement, and that is why we need more investment uh, opportunities so that we can de develop future leaders like Kenya uh, all over the world. Now, we're now going to fly over to Brazil and we're going to spend a couple of minutes with a friend of mine called Kevin. Kevin, over to you. The Amazon rainforest, most of you have heard about it. And with it, you may, be, you may have seen a few advertisements, commercials, telling us to preserve the nature and the animals there. 
And we, it, it is really important, and I know it, it is. But we are missing something that is important as well, the people that live there. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kevin Oyama, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the project that changed the reality of a very small community in Brazil. The project Scouting the Amazon Rainforest is started off as an Start of demand of developing scouting in a very small region of Brazil called Alto Solimões. The region is composed by nine small cities along the river Alto Solimões and has a population of 200,000 people, and most of them are indigenous. And as we look deeper into the, dem into the region and the demand, we saw a few social problems as prostitution, alcoholism, sexual abuse of young people, and use of drugs. And then we saw an opportunity of developing scouting and using scouting as a way of keeping those young people away from those problems. And we knew it wouldn't be an easy task to do, but we accept that. So to begin with, we train and give course to the volunteers so they can be prepared and know more about the scout movement. We gave them the educational materials so they can study about it, and it was great. And the interesting part was, we saw the engagement of indigenous people in learning more about the scout movement. So much that in one of the basic courses that was going to happen, 25 indigenous people showed up unexpectedly, asking for a preliminary course that was not going to happen. But our professional team was ready for it, because they are scouts. So they gave the, prelim the preliminary course to them, and it was great, it was awesome, it was a success. A second step that we, we made in the project was to create and produce 5,000 booklets to raise awareness about the use of drugs. And it was distributed by the scouts in their own communities. But the project wouldn't be a success without our volunteers. So volunteers from different parts from Brazil, they came to the region and they helped the volunteers that are from there to to know how to apply a good quality scout activity to the young people. It was amazing, it was great. And one important action that happened in the project was the involvement of young scouts from 18, from 18 to 21 years old that were selected, training, and were located in the project region so they can give support and teach the scout units how to develop and deliver good quality scout activities to the young people that live there. But well, the project wasn't perfect. We had a few challenges. The first one was distance. And do you know how big Brazil is? It is big. It is really big. So like most of you know Sao Paulo, which is a city right in the south of Brazil. And the region is right northwest of Brazil. And the distance between those two points is around 6,000 kilometers. And the only two ways of getting in the region we attend the project is by boat, which will take you at least seven days from Manaus, and by plane, which is really expensive. The other challenge was communication, okay? Because everybody that has TV broadcast connections, but cell phone signal and internet connection is really hard to find. And when you get to find it, it works terribly. In the language side, well, the Ticuna people, the indigenous people, they only started learning Portuguese at the age of 14. And now the culture, well, it was a challenging thing. Because in Brazil, it's common to have scout activities outdoors in the nature. But well, the people that live there, they live in the middle of the forest. <laughs> they are in the middle of the nature. So it's not something, it was really common for them. It is normal for them. So it was not attractive to them. So it was a challenge for us and for the volunteers and the young scouts that went there to support the scout units to develop a new way of delivering scouts to those young people in an attractive way. And we did it. It was amazing. It was a success. But it was a challenge for us. And we did it. The challenge was to develop scout in a very remote area. And we did it. It was great. As a result of everything, we opened new, eight new scout units. We have increased by 100% the number of young scouts in the region. 
We have reached more than 1,000 young people to be enrolled as a scout in the future. We have trained more than 400 volunteers and others to become scout leaders in the future. And we have reached, uh, indirectly, more than 8,000 people in the region. And we know we may not have changed the world, but we, ha we made a huge impact in the life of their communities. Thank you. So Brazil is big. It's really big. I never knew. Um, key takeaways from that. Scouting is for everybody. It's for every religion, every gender, every nationality, every language, every culture. It doesn't matter. It's inclusive. And what we're trying to achieve at WASM and in scouting around the world is a safe place for all kinds of children to get involved and to develop their skills. So now we're just going to hop over the border of Brazil, the big, big country, um, to Ecuador. And we have Barbara Palacios, who's going to tell us about an environmental program. Let me tell you a story that my scout leader told me when I was a little girl. It was 1909 in England. The city was very foggy. Mr. Voice, an American publicist, was looking for an address. He stopped under a lantern so he can read his map, when suddenly a boy appeared. Can I help you, sir? Oh, please, I'm looking for this address said Mr. Voice. Sure, I will take you there. So they walked together, and when they were arriving to the place, Mr. Voice tried to find some coins in his pocket. But the voice said, don't worry, sir, I am a scout, and scouts help others without reward. Mr. Was, Mr. Voice was so amazed by this action that he went to the National Office of England and talked to Baden Powell himself, and then he became a scout in America. My name is Barbara Palacios. I am a scout of Ecuador and a scout for almost 20 years. The story that I told you is very important because the scouts learn that good turns are important. When you are a kid, a little one, a good turn is helping your parents doing house chores. When you grew up, for example, when I was 17, my scout leader asked me to make a project, to create a project that changes the world. When he told me that, in the same way I'm telling you, I answered him, no way, not even the United Nations are asked to do that. Why are you asking me that? He laughed, like you, and, <laughs> and um, I said, but he said, I believe in you, you can do that. So he gave me two weeks to create my project. And by that time, my city was devastated by fires in the forest. And I really love forest. So I was so indignated by these arsonists that love to fire the forest. Uh, so inspired by my mom's idea, I created a project uh, called Sembrando Futuro, which means, which means planting my future, to, to reforest those devastated areas. I put my ideas on a paper and presented to my peers and team leader, and they destroyed it. They practically ripped it off. So because my project was an activity, not a project. A project is a sum of activities. And um, 
I was devastated. I was overwhelmed, exhausted. I didn't want to continue with the project, but my scout leader was very persistent. He motivates me to improve the project after school and helped me to do that. So I did it, and we started uh, training 25 people uh, of my scout group in conservation and reforestation so they can replicate information with the other people of my group. One year later, 125 people start um, to reforest one hectare with 300 trees. And um, when we finished, my scout leader said, OK, let's do this greater. How can we do that? So I love challenges. So I decided to join all the scout groups in the activity, the, the all the scout groups of my city, which was Quito. Uh, the logistics w has to be, have to be greater because you have to plan transportation, I had to send letters to a lot of institutions to get resources, and uh, we get all of that. And in, 2000, in 2010, 1,000 1, people planted, was planting trees. I believe that the small actions inspire big dreams. So this initiative was broadcast in national media, and I started to receive a lot of calls from groups from all the country asking to join the initiative. So my project became national, and I had the support of the national office, of the Ecuador the Scout National Office. And um, after that, the project became an uh, annual activity. Every year, scouts planting trees once a year. And um, four years later, we had 4,000 scouts planting trees every year. And in 2014, we thought that the project has enough credentials to be presented to the prime minister of the environmental minister of, the, of Ecuador. So we did a pilot with, with the minister. Uh, we planted trees in national parks. And the pilot was a success, not because of the people that participated, the, the number of people, but because the minister was so impressed about scouts, about our efficiency and passion, because we are very organized, a very organized movement. So they were so impressed that the next year, the minister decided to call the whole country in action to plant a tree. In one of the meetings, the minister that was a woman said, what if we try to beat a Guinness record of the largest number of people planting trees in one day? Can you imagine that? Um, I never imagined that. It was a great, great idea. So the government started a public campaign motivating people to, do, to join the, the event that day um, to, to become part of the initiative. Um, I remember that day because you can see all social media full of photos of people planting trees, schools planting trees, hospitals, companies, the army, the police, everyone was planting a tree. I remember the face of a little boy of eight years old could be that was trying to plant a tree without breaking one of the branches of the tree and putting a name of his new planted tree. It was beautiful. So um, guess what? We won the Guinness record of the largest number of people planting trees at the same time. But besides the record, which is important, which really means or, or is important to me, is that when you plant a tree, you create a connection with nature. You remember nature. Sometimes we forget nature. So planting a tree is something really important and beautiful. And, and having the whole country doing that action, it's extraordinary. So this project is the sum of little good turns, like mine, like Byron Enriquez, who was my scout leader, or Ivan Peruano, who was the national um, di director of scouts in that time, the, the minister of environmental, the people, companies like Nestle that uh, support the project too. Um, so I hope that this chain of good turns inspire you, like the action of that boy inspired Mr. Voice, and you can 
feel motivated to know more about scouting movement and feel in love in the same way I did, because it's a movement that not only protects nature, but also can change the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Barbara. So, all human beings have the wonderfully simple thing known as an idea. Only human beings that are leaders actually implement that idea. And that is what Barbara has done. People said to her, no, that's never going to work. I'm pretty sure people said to Mark Zuckerberg, no, that's never going to work. And look what's happening there. And that is what scouting does. It gives people that energy, that determination, that inspiration to make a change. And on a local level, just planting one tree might not sound like very much. But when you combine a whole country getting involved, that actually has a global impact. And in this case, I'm reducing CO2 into the atmosphere. Now I'd like to go over to the Caribbean Grab your pina coladas, because we're going to Haiti. Antoine, you're up next, my friend. Good morning, everybody. I am Brice from Haiti. Haiti is a beautiful Caribbean island. It's good to live there. But our geographical position made us a risky country. But thankfully, we had scout. Like I said, Haiti is a risky country, OK? And we know that. We made a structure, and we can help when a disaster happens. And in 2016, we was hit by a huge hurricane. This hurricane destroyed a huge part of our country. And we was the first responder there. We helped people in first head. We built tents, and we managed some camps. A scout is a leader. He knows how to manage camp and take care of people. Like I said, Haiti is a risky country. In 2010, we were hit by a huge, huge earthquake, 7.3 magnitude. Personally, I was first came back to school and watching TV, just relaxing. And the earth started shaking behind my feet, and I just went away. And after that, I go back. Thankfully, my house didn't fall down, and me and some scout friends we go outside with first head kids and start to help people. After that, all of the scouts in the country made some camps, built tents, and managed those camps. Again, we was hit by a huge, very, very huge hurricane again. It was a big square, and on top of your, of your head, destroy everything on, on its way. It was very, very devastating again. But only us had, at, the, at this time, the satellite phone. Even the prime minister came to see us and to have information. People said, oh, if those guys can do those things without big materials, I have to put my kids on this organization. And that's why. We grow our scout population. Now we are more than 30,000. Those guys didn't impact the only community. This impact was for the entire country. And now I can say Asian Scout are prepared. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, mon ami. So we've heard now two stories about scouts working in disasters. That is one of the areas that we do encourage young people to get involved. However, we are not experts in disaster response. What we are is a mobile, prepared, and dedicated network of young men and women who are in all communities in 169 different countries or 202 countries and territories, you pick your figure, who want to leave the world a better place than they found it. And if, like Antoine, you live, unfortunately live in a place that is cyclically hit by hurricanes and natural disasters, cholera, humanita humanitarian issues, then the scouts are going to reflect the issues uh, and the need. And that's what we have with Antoine. Now, supporting the development of these scouting um, heroes, as I will call them now, are national scout organizations. And what we're trying to do is invest in them so we can strengthen them and support more scouts. And the next story from Nicolas, we go back to Ecuador, and we're going to look at how we strengthen national scout organizations. Over to you, Nicolas. Hello. I want to share with you two ideas very important for me. One idea, I've been a witness, witness that scout movement have the receipt for the success. And number two, hard work and persist. If you have two things of that, everything is possible. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicolas Zapata. I am 25 years old, and I want to share with you, my story. In 2012, World Scout Organization and SGS signed an agreement to develop a special tool to give standards, to give a process, and to guarantee the quality of the national office. It called it Global Scout Assessment Tool. In English, GSAT. So for us, it was a very interesting idea because we wanted clear rules. So we started to know about that, and it said, it for the first year, it's free. So we said, OK, <laughs> let's take the challenge. It's our opportunity. So we started. What a mistake. <laughs> so hard work, a lot of information, a lot of documentation. We take it out of the comfort zone. Very difficult. A lot of things to do to get information and something like that. After uh, that tornado, <laughs> we did it. We get the certification, and Scout Ecuador was certified. But what happened next? We have other, other face to the organization, to the, I don't know, to a lot of things. Now we can go to a, a company and we said, OK, we are Scouts Ecuador. We, can, we want to work with you, work with us. And we said, OK, but what do you have? We have an international certification of the World Scout Organization to work with us. And said, yes, of course, we want, to, we want to work with you. That happened. Very good for us. But we started to, uh, to think, OK, what happened next? What is the next step? What do we have to do now? It was a lot of meetings with a lot of person, the national team, the volunteers, uh, all, all of, uh, a lot of things, a lot of person, of people. And we have idea. We have to sensibilize the scout groups. We have to have clear rules in Ecuador. And we, we said, OK, why not design these kinds of tools for the scout groups? Because we have the opportunity to do that. So we started that project. 
It's not easy. A lot of works. The first question, OK, you said you, you want a model of a scout group. Where you have that information? Who is the person that know that? Good question. <laughs> so we started to think about that. And the question was very easy. We have models, we have documents, we have books that we know that. We only make a special tool, a manager, a manager tool, that you can see all the things. OK. Then we designed a process. It sounds very easy for us. OK. So national office or the uh, national team sent pe pe people to the groups, to the scout groups, each scout group. And then they get the information to analyze that, analyze that information. And they can have a, continu a continuous improving. This sounds very easy. But it's not very easy. <laughs> when we started to do that, we have a lot of problems. For example, a scout leader don't want it. All scout leaders, sorry for my words, they said it's not necessary. It's not for us. We are a scout. We have to camp. It's not necessary for us. You're <laughs> some scout leaders saying, you're so young. Go back to the, the rovers. You don't go into it. It's not for you. OK, a lot, of, a lot of mistakes, a lot of work later. We said, OK, we, we have the information, but we need something else. We need some, some kind of thing to motivate the scout groups to do that. Then we think, OK, then send some task. Analyze, uh, we, uh, we are going to analyze the information, and we are going to send some task, only three, every year. Only work this year in these three tasks. And we had a, a few groups. We started to do that. In, this time, in, the, in, that, in that time, we are only five persons for around 100 groups in all the, all the country. So the first group, we get the information. Then we send the, the task. And one, two, they get back the, the information. So we finish the process. Wow, we did it. It was the first time. So the first question was, OK, what next? What have to do now? So uh, we, del uh, we, give, we, uh, we give these groups a special award, like uh, the, the Champions League a trophy. And each year, we give a batch of the year. So every year, the group finish the, the process and give a batch. It was awesome. And we complete the process. All changed. But we have new problems. Because we need resource. All the, all the people that go to the groups need resource. All the, the information we get, it was in an Excel file. So it was very difficult to get reports or something like that. So we started to work. And we finan uh, financed that. Why? Because we want a very huge objective for us. Then, with the finance, with the resource, we have two important things that we can achieve. One thing, we develop a scout system for scouts to get all the information and to have all the information. It was very clear now for us, because when you get the information, we make an important system that they give you the result automatically. So when the national team go to the group, they automatically you have the results. For example, if you go to a work, if the group is, uh, is not, not in a good way, it's great. So it's not bad. It's a warning for us to send national team to help the group. If the group is yellow, so the group is not good, not bad. Keep working, but you're not good. So keep in mind that and work. And if you is green, like a traffic light, OK, you're OK. Keep going. That was amazing for that. We know that it's very difficult to develop that kind of system. So we decide to design this kind of system to, with a condition or a possibility to reply this in other scout associations. We are now looking for a new project 
we, our lab, uh, we have that project in the Scout Donation Platform, if you want to check it later. So, and with this project, with this system, we have a, a lot of uh, less work to us. The second important part, and more important for us now, is we training a special team for that. We now, in the, in the beginning, we are only five persons, white people. Now, we are 70 people. 70 people that go to the groups and can give a good service to the group. We develop uh, books, manuals, and uh, e-learning training for all the new people that come to the, to, the, to the team to be quickly, because the group needs attention every day, every time. So after that, we realize that now the national team have 43% of, of the people are between 21 of, uh, to 30 years. So it was awesome for us. For end my intervention in this moment, in my, my part in this moment, I only can say that in our organization for the 2023 want to be one million of boys and girls in the world. With these kinds of opportunity of security, of sensitize the group, we can know that we are in a good way to do it. Thank you very much, and this is my intervention. Thanks, Nicholas. Thank you. Okay, here is your five second warning. It is audience participation time. Brace yourself. It's a Friday morning, it's been a long week, so we need to get exercising just a tiny, 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 tiny bit. I, just out of interest, would like to know how many of you have been in the Scouts? So raise your hand. Your Majesty, good. Oh, you, you didn't? Ah. You married one, that's just as good. So the, que the Queen counts, <laughs> just through association. So I c over here, not too many, we've got plenty at the front here. Okay, good. Now. Nicholas there was doing something that I love to do, and that's to talk quite in depth about scouting. And scouting for people that have not been in it is like talking another language. So I just want to translate basically what has happened in Ecuador. Where you have strong scouting, or where you have strong leadership, sorry, you have strong scouting. Where you have strong scouting, you have good access to education, for more young people, you have more community actions, and you have a group of young people who are going to develop into future business leaders, leaders of your country, etc. Now, by spending some time with the Ecuadorian scouts, we end up with leaders like Barbara. And we've done the same in Mexico, and we've done the same in a lot of the countries that are represented here, and this is the result. That is a wonderful return on investment. I hope you agree. So we're off to the final speaker. His name is Camillo. Camilo? Not Camillo, not a double L. Um, and he's from Colombia. Camillo, over to you. You was born for big things, never settle for less. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Camilo Ayala and I'm from Colombia. And today I'm gonna tell you the story about how this sentence changed my life. I was born in the east of my country in a little town called Puerto Rico. There is a scenario, a beautiful, beautiful town. But there was the scenario of a lot of battles between the FARC and the government of Colombia. One of them was remembered as the biggest guerrilla take in the story, 
when more than 2,500 guerrilla people take my town. In that moment, me and my family have to hide us under the bed and pray and hope that anything bad gonna happen. After two weeks, uh, we can get out with the knock of a door. And there was a person who told us that we have to move from this place or they will kill us. My family, of course, take our stuff and we go for the only truck in that little town. In that moment was a banana truck. We moved to the next town and there happened one of the saddest moments of my life. I went to the school as a normal kid and there one day I say, my uncle, please go for me to the school. He said yes, and when he was waiting for me in the door of his school, and I listened to the ring that announced the finish of the classes, I started a combat. A person who was behind my uncle shoot him two times in front of me. I feel really sad in that moment and run to try to hug him in my hands, but of course I was so little compared with him. And in that moment, he told me something that changed my life. Life is too short to be sad. Don't forget to smile. And you was born for big things. Don't settle with less. At that moment, I was scared and I run to tell my grandmother what happened. There, uh, I watched the destruction of my little town, the blood on the streets, the people died, the people crying, and was disappointing to be there. My family and I decide to move to Bogota, the capital of the city. But we don't have money, we don't have food, we don't have even a place to stay. We have to live in the streets. With the time, life's change. And the, the, the thing that changed my life was a scouting. In that time, my biggest dream was become a soldier to fight against the FARC and finish them. And one day, I saw those kids, a troop, was perfectly uniformed, and I say, oh, they are like mini soldiers. <laughs> so I say, it's perfect for me. But for a coincidence, the son of my teacher was a scout, and he invited me for one meeting. And I said, yes, of course I won. I wonder, and you know what? I hate it. Because w they wasn't mini soldiers. They wasn't. So I just leave it and never go back to this group. So I started my studies in a military school, and there I met with an arts teacher. He was a scout leader. And he makes me feel proud of myself because I draw a lot of things that I remember of my childhood. And he said, you're good, you're talented, you can do big things. And I remember the words of my uncle in that moment. He invited me for a scout meeting in his group. And I say, yes, again, but I say like, yes. <laughs> in that moment, uh, he gave me my uniform after one year to start to go to the group. And during this, during this year, he teach me how to change the world. And I changed my mind. Now, I didn't want to kill every person in the park. I want to change them in good person, because good persons can create a better world. <sighs> in 2015, I had the opportunity to go to Guatemala City to win an event called the Inter-American Leadership Training. There, I met 60 brothers and sisters in a scout. And they give me the confidence, the strength, and all that I need to have the courage to tell my story. So I was a new person. But to create a better world, I need to create a better Camilo. So what I did, I go back from my little town. And for a coincidence, I watched 
the person that 15 years ago killed my uncle in front of me. I feel really sadness and scared, but I go to him and I say something really important. Hi, my name is Camilo, and maybe you don't remember, my, rem remember me, but I was the child that 15 years ago was in front of you when you killed this man. I don't know if you remember, but I'm here to tell you something today. I forgive you. And something more important, I hope that you can forgive yourself. I just go back because I start to cry and I don't want that he watch me cry. And <laughs> well, I go back to Bogota and I was really motivated. What, I, what can I do to change the world? So I'm an artist. So what I do? I made a short film. This short film tells us my story to the world with a message of peace, forgiveness, and reconciliation. In, in Inter-American Leadership Training, I made the Messengers of Peace program. And now, I become a messenger of peace. Because the peace is the message that I want to give all the world. In 2017, I get another excellent opportunity. I went to the War Scout Conference and War Scout Youth Forum in Azerbaijan. And what happened there? It's a training, a training in dialogue for peace. I say, dialogue, peace? Sounds like Colombia needs that. And of course, I learned a lot of things, things that now I want to apply in my country to better the understanding, the love, the peace. So in that moment, I think that Colombia needs scouting. The world needs scouting. Now I'm a different person. I want to dialogue more, to learn more, and to forgive all the people in Colombia. But beginning is that every people in Colombia forgive themselves. Thank you very much, and don't forget create a better world. It's, um, it's not been easy for these young men and women to, to come here today and to stand on this stage and, and to tell their story, particularly when they're as emotional um, as Camillo's. But they've done it because they believe it's a story that is worth sharing. I just want to pick up on something that Camillo said then um, in his closing paragraph. The world needs scouting. There is, a, I think, a misconception, certainly in, in England, where I'm from, that scouting is nice to have. But hopefully we've corrected that and updated that misconception um, because scouting is need to have, not just nice to have. Um, can I just ask the speakers just to stand up in a, in a line, all of the guys that have come over from, from all over the place, um, and can I ask you to give them just one more round of applause because I think they deserve it. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. And also thank you to Cynthia and, and Jacob who have had, and Victor as well over there. Yeah. Put your hands up. Wave to the audience. Thank you. Um, they've had a lot of sleepless nights because I've pushed them a bit too much. So, sorry. And thank you. Um, now I would like to invite Lars Koland, uh, the chairman of the World Scout Foundation, to take a seat. Ooh. And also Craig Turpey, uh, the World Scout Committee chairperson. So we've now got the adults on stage, so we need to behave a little bit. seen it a lot today. Um, I was just stood at the side of the stage 
whilst the speakers uh, were doing their thing, and I wrote down a couple of questions, and I wanted to ask Craig first. These are amazing stories. I hope you'll agree. But are these people exceptional? Are they different? Are they not the norm? Thank you for the question, Tom. I think uh, all of us can agree that having heard these stories today, that the individuals uh, and, uh, that we've heard from are truly uh, exceptional. The program in scouting takes ordinary people and turns them into extraordinary leaders who go on to make a positive contribution uh, in their communities. And one of the joys that I have in my role is hearing stories like these every day of the week. We have 50 million scouts around the world who are doing very similar actions in villages, towns and cities in every corner uh, of the planet. And after having, hearing these, having heard these stories today, if anyone was ever in any doubt about the ability for scouting to create a better world, I think we've heard the evidence here today. We should take great comfort that the world is in safe hands with leaders uh, of tomorrow like those that we've witnessed here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good answer, good answer. Now, Lars, I want to move us on a little bit to more the business concept, uh, which is what the World Scout Foundation is. We have a number of investors, a number of potential investors in the room. What would your advice be to them as an investor yourself? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, actually, I would invite all these investors to look upon the young people we have just listened to and not only as young people but actually as citizens of a country that you are not that you haven't heard about because these 10 or whatever people are citizens of a country called scouting and have you imagined how large that country is it has a head of state his Majesty is sitting right here. It has a Prime Minister, he sits there. It has 51 million young people under training in 1.5 million different locations around the world. It has another 600 million people who have completed their training. So with about 600 million people, it is the third largest nation on the planet. And that's where you guys should invest. But let me take you a little further and look upon that nation. It is the only nation in the world which has a purpose. And that purpose is to form tomorrow's leaders and put them into action, provide them opportunities to make the world a better place. So that is a country with a purpose. It's also a country with values which is explained in very, very simple legislation, which is called the Scout Law. It can be written on the backside of a stamp. It's very, very simple. And it's about the values of that country. Uh, it has a, a very modest central government. So it's, it's actually, that's not where your money will go. The central government of that country has about 300 people and only about 100 of them earn a salary. 200 aren't earning anything other than the joy of doing it. So a country with 600 million people with a central government at about 300, that's not too bad. If you take the entire public sector, which is everybody that receives a salary, it's 10,000. And can you imagine a country with 600 million who only have 10,000 salaried employees? that country is worth investing in because it's not defined by a certain area such as Mexico. It is everywhere in the world. And the citizens of that country are in every corporation, every government, everywhere. And they are not doing the, uh, some of them are doing the sweeping of the floor, but really where they are is at the top. So you are investing in a country with 600 million people who are changing the world already. And your investment, of course, has to make a return because this already exists. And the investment that I invite you to join us in doing 
is to invest doubling that country. So it will have more than a billion people, uh, more than a hundred million young people under training. Uh, and if we can do that, and I'm convinced we can do it before 2023, right? Correct. If we can do it, then I think the, the enormous difference, positive difference, that scouting is making to the world already could double. And then I think the world would be a much better place. May I quote the prime minister of my country, who uh, at one occasion said, uh, frankly speaking, if I am to talk about and define what scouting is, to me, it is the strongest community in the world. And he added, it is the community that has the largest social impact whatsoever of any community or country. So that's where I think you should put your dollars or pesos or whatever it is. That's at least where my family puts ours. So get going. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. We also take Bitcoin as well, if you're interested in giving <laughs> any of them. So I'm going to go a little off piece now. Do you gentlemen mind receiving some questions from the audience? Is that okay? Be delighted. Good. Absolutely. By the way, this is, this is being recorded. So when you said, yes, by 2023, we will have 100 million members, we'll remind you of that. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions for Lars or for Craig? I don't want any, so just for Craig and Lars. There is a microphone at the back. At the side, it's coming. If you could say your name and who you're directing okay. the question at, or for. Muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Gerardo Sánchez. Voy a hacer la pregunta en español. Okay. Y la pregunta es relacionada en el motor de la generosidad. ¿Cómo este motor de la generosidad, este ha funcionado y, y funciona todos los días en todos los parques de, del mundo y este, además de eso, este, que me puedan explicar un poquito más cómo sigue funcionando y cómo sigue creciendo esto que es tan generoso. Gracias. ¿Quién es la pregunta para? Señora. El panel. Good. The one in the middle. Thank you very much. Could, sorry, could I ask you just to repeat the question? Because yes, we I would like to, to ask about the generosity motor, the, the movement of, of this, of, of this uh, kind of uh, scouting. It's all about generosity, and they go and say to someone, may I help you, and it doesn't cost anything, and I can help you to cross the street, I can help you if you need something. It's all about generosity, and this creates some kind of, of big movement in the, uh, in the world. And how does these expansions go on, because they don't want anything but help and, and give the generosity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. As I was listening to the stories uh, earlier, one of the things that I observed was that all of the scouts who took to the platform were wearing different uniforms, reflective of the countries that they come from. But they have scarves, and they all have a purple badge. And this purple badge symbolizes the unity uh, of the movement. And it reminds us as well that we're uh, brought together by uh, a common bond uh, and a, a belief uh, in our mission in scouting through the promise and law, uh, the promise that we make and the laws that we adhere to. And it's from this really simple foundation that we have that we are able to develop and grow scouting in every corner uh, of this planet. Uh, that is what unites us. And the programs that we have are extremely adaptable to every reality in every country. Uh, in 1907, uh, when Baden-Powell uh, experimented with a camp on Brown Sea Island, I don't think he could have ever imagined that it would lead to the creation of 
the world's leading educational youth movement, and by all accounts, uh, the world's leading leadership development uh, program. Uh, but here we are today, and it is our mission to build on that strong foundation, which has lasted for 111 years now, to bring scouting to even more young people. And as I'll go on record as saying, we have an ambition to bring scouting to 100 million young people by 2023. It's taken us 110 years to get to 50 million, so we've got a lot of work to do in the next six years. But we are more confident than ever as a movement that we can do that because we are united uh, with this ambition. Because when we look around in the world today, we can see that scouting is needed more than ever for all of the various reasons that we've heard in the stories and testimonies uh, today. Thank you, Craig. Lars? <clears throat> I think you gave a wonderful answer, but I'd like to alert you to a piece of statistics that might surprise you. Throughout the world, there are like 1.5 million small barrios with an average of 4,000 people. So the whole world consists of about 1.5 million barriers of that kind. In every single one of them, on average, there is a scout unit. So everywhere is a scout unit of, say, 40 people. Now, since this has been going on for 100 years, probably in that barrio of 4,000 people, there are at least 400 adults who have completed training, probably 600. And in that barrio, these four or 500 people are taking the leading positions. That is the social impact scouting has today. And what Craig is talking about is simply double that number. Thank you, thank you gentlemen. Now we have a few hundred of our investors here uh, in the room, and I would love to hear from one of those, if any of you guys have um, a question. Now, to, for those of you that don't know, you can identify the current investors by this gold pin that they have on or the neckerchief around their necks. So are there any questions from the BP fellows? Quiet today, that's a first. That is an absolute first. Okay, well, there is the opportunity. Oh, we have one, we have one. This, the microphone is to your right. Yes, my name is Tom from the United States of America. Uh, we talked about um, leveraging, or maybe we haven't talked about leveraging the investment as much as we should. Um, I know in the United States of the um, numbers, of, uh, numbers of scouters, 95% uh, I believe are volunteers. And so only a very small part of our investment goes to the uh, paying of, of professionals to promote scouting. So what does the other money go to? Can you explain that? Good question. Stumped. Very good question. Uh, the World Scout Committee and the World Scout Bureau uh, benefit from uh, income that comes from the World Scout Foundation thanks to your uh, generosity and that is augmented by uh, fees that come from the National Scout organizations and like uh, many organizations with big ambitions we work hard to make the very most uh, of the resources that we have at our disposal and it's a constant exercise to make sure that the, the funds that you provide uh, to us are getting down to the most local level uh, as Lars has explained, we have a, a very uh, small uh, centralized uh, operation, but we also have uh, regional uh, presences uh, in six regions around the world where a lot of the hard work is done in supporting national scout organizations on the very topics that need to be addressed in order to help them to develop and grow. And uh, that money uh, reaches them in various ways, including through uh, messengers of peace, but a lot of hard work is done through our six regions in supporting those national scout organizations with updating their programs to make sure that they reflect the needs of young people today. Uh, also updating of the adult training uh, schemes to make sure that 
it's an attractive proposition for adults to want to volunteer and get involved uh, in this great game uh, that we call scouting. But there's also, importantly, work done to support national scout organizations in telling the story of scouting, because the stories that you've heard here today are fantastic examples in helping uh, reaching out to communities to uh, help explain the value uh, of what we do. And another important factor is trying to ensure that our national scout organizations are sustainable, that they have the capacity to continue to grow, and that we're not just supporting them with short-term interventions, but the work that we do, uh, thanks to your gen generosity, leads to sustained growth uh, over the longer term, so that we can go from 100 million in 2023 and beyond. There's no reason why we can't be uh, reaching for the stars with this 150 million, 200 million. Let's keep going. Yeah. Good answer. Does that, does that help to answer your question? I hope so. Um, there is going to be plenty of opportunities this afternoon for you to come to the marketplace. I encourage you to come and speak to anybody with a gold pin, anybody with a neckerchief, and to the speakers as well. Um, to find out a little bit more about scouting and how you can get involved. Can I have a warm round of applause for Lars and Craig? <laughs> you can take your seats. And I now invite the Dean up to say some closing words. We want to thank World Scout Foundation for sharing this very valuable experiences with us. They have had an impact in our university community. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, Jessica, Kenya, Maricela, Kevin, Barbara, Antoine, Nicolas, and Camilo. Now, I want to give the floor our dean in the campus of Mexico City, Dr. Santiago Garcia Alvarez, who will share with us how the Universidad Panamericana is also cooperating to create a better world. Good morning to all of you. We are very honored for having these people with us here today. Thank you for accepting our invitation from the Universidad Panamericana and for sharing these very interesting stories because we have listened to them gladly. I, wanted, I was remembering that in this university, following the, the example of the previous earthquake, September 19th, we had a very interesting experience regarding the university community because this was effectively something that we hadn't foreseen and it just happened out of the blue. And when it happened, it turned out that the university community started moving and mobilizing in a very quite interesting manner. And I'm saying this as a uh, as a simple piece of information in which um, sometimes it seems that math do not meet the requirements because in this campus of Universidad Panamericana we have 4,400 students and when the earthquake happened and we started seeing the volunteering by, um, on part of the students they started creating these lists and during those days they carried out very hard work and towards the end we counted how many volunteers we had on those lists and it turned out that we had 4,900 way more than the members of this university community and I am mentioning this example to show you how young people are becoming engaged and how they are attracting other people and how they are capable of working on, for a common cause this is explained not only by logic and by maths, but also but with a different logic. We need to explain this with a different logic, because even though we have a small community in numbers, we can see that our hearts and the brains of the university community is way bigger than that those simple equations. And this is something very important, because generally we think that any kind of project, for example, in the field of innovation, in which we have plenty of initiatives on the part of university students, well, it is not enough just to have a good idea or a good creative project. It is always very important to think about the social impact that our project or our initiative may have. And this is what I am, and this, what I'm talking about is our philosophy here in Universidad Panamericana. 
we have to think about how we can make an imp a good impact in our close communities and of course in the world in general. Currently, and we can see this in many countries, there are many social problems and that they create anguish in all of us. We are also realizing that it is not enough to have isolated solutions or that come from a single agent in society. Most of the times the solution for big social problems have to come from civil societies. They come from where Alejandro Llano comes and a vital echoes of the society. We have seen this in the examples that scouts have given to us. And what is very interesting here is how we have a, a wide range of initiatives by civil society which are very generous in which they are becoming engaged and then we can measure that result and we can see the, the wonderful res the wonderful impact that they can have we are used to having uh, an interest logic becoming interested in us in some subject and some political party or something and i think that the what we have learned today and what the Universidad Panamericana and the Scout Movement have shown us is that that logic should not prevail. The logic that, that should be the most important one in this world is the logic that would answer the question of generosity. The logic of generosity and gifts. Yes, we have plenty of initiatives from people who really want to make a change in the world from their own sectors, from their own um, lives and from their own works. That may have an, an impact globally and that can carry out a true transformation. That's why today we are very happy and very proud of taking part in this event. And finally, since we are talking about a university and the place where we are in is a university, you cannot go without homework. And I think that, and that homework is the following. If we all have a different way of thinking, and if we all think, how, what can I do to be more generous and to create a bigger impact? Or let's think, what can I do if I am a young university student and I am studying a, a major? What can I do to make a life commitment and, and make a real transformation? Then, if, if you do this, this event will be very useful. I want to thank the Universidad Panamericana. It has a very important leadership, a very important sense of leadership within the community and within the university and at a global level. Thank you for having this initiative. And thanks to the scouts as well, to this amazing foundation that has a huge impact. I previously heard something about the scouts, but after these presentations, I have an, uh, they made a big impact on me. And to finish this event, we would like to give um, a little recognition or a little gift to your majesty. On behalf of all of the university community, we want to thank you for your presence in this university. Su majestad, si puede acercarse al podio. Well, we're very honored for having your majesties here, the king, the queen, and some princes. And before ending the event, I please come to the main speakers so that he can give a final words. And please a round of applause to all our invitees.